Okay, let's continue our discussion on airfoils and wings. Uh, to get started, I'd like to try a little exercise here. Let's think about an airfoil as it changes angle of attack. So let me just draw that again. Um, let's say here's my airfoil, here's V infinity, and this angle here is the angle of attack. So we can start from zero, or we can start negative, you know, increase that angle of attack. Maybe even think about what happens as you decrease the angle of attack below zero. What I would like you to think about is what will the lift coefficient look like, right? Or in other words, what's the lift gonna do? How do you think it will change as we vary the angle of attack? Okay, so I'd like you to pause, take a minute and try that out. It will help you to uh, remember and understand this a little better. Okay, so we've tried that. Let's, let's think through this together. What's gonna happen when the angle of attack is zero? Okay, if it's, if it's zero, all right, and here's my airfoil. If the angle of attack is zero and the airfoil is symmetric, then I would expect there to be no lift, right? Because the flow would be exactly the same on the top and bottom, there'd be no force imbalance, uh, top and bottom, so no lift. But if the airfoil is cambered, right, so it's got some curvature to it, then the flow will still accelerate differently over top and bottom, and I will still potentially have some positive lift. Most of the time, for an aircraft, we have, at least in the wing, we don't have symmetric sections. We'll have non-symmetric sections like this, right? And so the uh, lift at zero degrees angle of attack is gonna be some positive number. Okay, so what happens as I increase that angle of attack? What do I expect to happen with the lift? Well, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna get more and more lift, right? I'm getting, increasing that angle. I'm able to uh, accelerate the flow even further around the airfoil, create a bigger pressure difference and generate more lift. And turns out, although you may not expect this, that that behavior is very linear. Um, the lift increases linearly with angle of attack. But what happens as we go further and further? Do we expect this to continue forever, 90 degrees beyond? Uh, actually, won't get anywhere close to 90 degrees. Um, it won't, you know, depending on the airfoil, you know, it's going to get it maybe uh, 10, 15, 20 degrees at most before it's going to stall. The lift co the lift is going to drop precipitously. Why is that? Well, thinking about our discussion last time with the blunt shape of a cylinder, recall that we have to uh, navigate this adverse pressure gradient, or also with the airflow we talked about this. As we increase angle of attack steeper and steeper, flow needs to bend around and recover along this long adverse pressure gradient. And if we have too sharp of a turn, get this really big peak in pressure, and we've got to come all the way back uh, so the flow doesn't jump around there. That's the pressure, the flow is still gonna come around, but it's got a really strong adverse gradient. And so if the angle of attack is really high, let's say, all right, flow accelerates, and because it's got such this adverse gradient, it's gonna separate, leave the airfoil, and I'm gonna leave behind this wake. So if that happens, uh, I get a lot of drag, but I also lose lift uh, significantly. Okay, and so this is called stall. All right, once, the angle, once that lift starts dropping, we call this stall. You've probably heard about this. Um, you know, it's something if you are a pilot, you have to train for, right, that you can recover from a stall. Uh, so this is, this is a, a very typical lift curve. Like I said, it's very linear until we start approaching stall. Theoretically, we're not gonna prove this, but in aerodynamics class you would. This slope here, the slope, this is the slope, um, is equal to two pi, which is pretty cool. Okay, so that's the slope. Sometimes we give it the symbol M. It's the change in lift with respect to alpha. And theoretically, it's two pi. With viscous effects, it's generally a bit less than two pi, but it's pretty close. Uh, other feature I'll point out here, this is called 
It's called the zero lift angle of attack. Okay, so it's the angle of attack at which I produce no lift. Again, if I had a symmetric airfoil, the zero lift angle of attack would be zero, but because I have a cambered airfoil, right, has some curvature to it, I actually have to get down to a negative angle of attack before I produce no lift. Okay, and I can continue down actually into further negative angles of attack and it'll be linear and there'll actually be a negative stall as well, usually earlier than the positive stall, but typically we don't fly there. That's, that's of less practical interest most of the time. So this curve here, we could describe it with this equation fairly simply. We could say, at least in the linear portion, right, that it's equal to the slope times alpha minus alpha zero. So it's just a linear equation. Um, all right, so when the angle of attack, actually I just gave two different definitions here. I'm, I'm gonna change this one, we'll call this alpha zero. So we match this one, right? When alpha is equal to alpha zero, right, when these are equal, this is zero, we get no lift. Otherwise I have this slope of two pi. So this just describes this line. Of course, it would keep going forever. It does not describe stall, but it describes my behavior uh, prior to stall, or at least even maybe a little bit more prior because it starts to curve a bit before, but at least away from stall. That's a very useful thing because this is very simple, right? The slope is two pi. Um, I may or may not know my zero lift angle of attack, but I can, you know, estimate it from my data or if it's symmetric, but I know it's zero. What that tells me though, is I can estimate my lift coefficient really simply, right? Just from this back of the envelope calculation, just kind of see where I'm at. This may seem a bit surprising, right? We said the slope is two pi and I didn't say anything about the shape of the airfoil, whether it was this really thick airfoil or it was just a very simple flat plate. That seems to suggest that we could really use anything, right? Like why do we have these fancy curves when we could just use a flat plate? And indeed it is true, I could use a flat plate or I could just take this book, right, and, and tilt it um, and I would get a similar lift curve, uh, at least initially. The problem with a flat one, I'll just draw it over here, is that because it's flat, it's not very robust to changes. So if, as it's flat, I have to navigate around the sharp edge and it's effectively infinite. I mean, viscosity or an infinite pressure gradient, viscosity makes it so it's not, but it's still really high. To navigate this really sharp turn, I need a really, really high change in pressure. And so it's really susceptible to separation, meaning it will stall much earlier. So indeed a flat plate will actually still follow the same lift curve slope, but it's just gonna stall really early. Um, of course, so this is kind of the trade-off, right? This flat plate is really great for maybe a drag perspective if you didn't stall, right? Because there's uh, these blunt shapes are gonna have more surface area, more skin friction drag, but they're not very robust. They're gonna create a lot of pressure drag once we get to stall. That's in large measure or large reason why we have these rounded shapes on the front of the airfoil. It gives us more robustness. So as the angle of attack changes across a, a wide variety of ranges, uh, I have this curvature that I can turn the flow more gradually without creating huge pressure differences that are gonna lead to separation. Uh, if I could do this in, a, in a, a morphing way, right? If I had a airfoil that could change the shape, the camber, you know, on the fly, then a very, very thin airfoil would actually be really ideal. And in fact, this is what birds do. If you look at the airfoil cross section, if you will, for a, a bird, um, their wings are extremely thin, right? basically a flat plate or a curved flat plate, but they, you know, are able to morph the shape in real time very quickly so that they can maintain kind of this ideal angle of attack where the flow can remain attached and they can adapt really quickly. But for, you know, practical large transport aircraft where we can't move these large inertial masses, I mean, we've, we haven't even really been able to solve this at the small scale. It's a hard engineering challenge, but at the large scale, even if we could, this is a lot of inertia, a lot of energy. You don't really want to do that. Uh, having these rounded shapes really helps to give you some robustness, uh, you know, to have, to, to, to delay stall. Okay, 
Let's lift. Uh, you might try the same thing with drag. And I'll, I'll ask you to pause. Just try this for one second. What do you think this looks like? One minute. Um, this may be not super intuitive on the negative side, but let's start with the positive side. So if I'm at zero degrees angle of attack, um, I'm going to have some drag, right? I'm, in fact, I'm always going to have drag. This is never going to be negative and it's never going to be zero. Drag is always going to be positive. Whereas my lift could be positive or negative. Drag is always positive. I, um, you know, unless I'm putting in energy, right? To produce thrust or something. This is just an airfoil. So any body and fluid is going to produce drag here in 2D. So I would expect perhaps that, uh, uh, well, I know it's positive, but I also suspect that as I increase angle of attack, that I'm also going to get more drag, right? Because effectively I'm creating a blunter shape. I've got to move around this thing. And I also suspect that at some point as I reach stall, the drag's going to go way up. And indeed it does look something like that. It's going to increase and at some point it's going to increase more rapidly. What may be less predictable, but if you think about it, it's kind of similar. As I go to negative angles of attack, um, a similar thing's going to happen, right? Where it's going to be blunt, it's going to increase drag, and at some point I'm going to hit the negative stall as well. For a symmetric aircraft, this, or airfoil, this would be centered again at zero. But for a cambered airfoil, it's not, right? It's going to be shifted just like our lift curve is kind of shifted. It's not at zero. I'm not going to have zero, the, the minimum, at uh, zero degrees. So it might look something like this for a cambered airfoil. And in fact, it's typically close to quadratic, outside of stall at least. I've drawn it this way as a drag versus angle of attack, but perhaps more commonly for an aerodynamicist, we actually plot it versus the lift coefficient. Uh, but those, again, outside of star linear, so it will look fairly similar. Here's actually a, a picture of what that might look like. <clears throat> uh, just a visualization of, of drag and lift coefficient. See if you can identify what is what here. <clears throat> Let's first look at lift. So this is, this is also from X-Foil. This curve right here, that's my lift curve. So as I increase angle of attack, you can see I've got this fairly linear behavior. And as I approach stall, it starts to decrease and then I get this rapid drop of lift, off of lift coefficient. Um, over here on the right, uh, it's plotted. It's the same curve. Remember the drag curve, we plotted it and it looked like this, right? Kind of quadratic. It's the same curve, but we've tilted the axis this way. The reason for that is so that this lift axis here and this left axis are the same axis, right? So we could compare and see which drag corresponded to which lift, and which angle of attack. So there's just a one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is my lift, here's drag. So you can see uh, the minimum is not at zero. In this case, it's a cambered airflow, as we can tell, because the lift is non-zero at a zero degrees angle of attack. So it's just like the other one. Um, and it increases kind of quadratically here where it blows up, this is just a numerical artifact that's not really physical, but this particular program, you know, can't really predict the behavior post-stall, so it just kind of blows up there. But we get this quadratic, it will rapidly increase, but we get this quadratic increase in drag. This last curve here is the pitching moment. We didn't really talk about that too much. Um, theoretically, for a thin airfoil, the pitching moment is going to be constant with angle of attack, and it's fairly close to constant, not exactly, um, but it's usually going to be pretty close to that. Um, by the way, if I didn't notice, if we didn't notice here, we, we often refer to this as a drag polar, right? The variation of drag with lift and the lift curve, we just call it with a, we would just call it a lift curve. So that discussion really revolved around subsonic airfoils or even into transonic if we have supersonic cases, so uh, like a supersonic aircraft or say the fins on a rocket, uh, the airfoil shape is quite different. Even though we said we want a blunt leading edge for robustness so that we don't stall, for supersonic flow, we get shock waves and that blunt shape is, leads to massive increases in drag. And so we need to have a sharp leading edge uh, here at the airfoil. And we need very thin shapes, very thin airfoils. So they're not, the most efficient airfoils, in fact, they're not very efficient at all, but we're going so fast 
that we just, the dynamic pressure is huge. We can generate a lot of lift, sufficient lift, um, you know, with, with, without having to have thicker airfoils or blunt leading edges and things like that. So in you know, a very thin, very sharp airfoil uh, prevent uh, the large increases in drag from shock waves. And we'll talk more about that later in the semester when we talk about supersonic flow. I'll talk briefly about NACA 4 series airfoils. These are not, uh, let's say, great airfoils in terms of efficiency, but they're a very good reference airfoil. They're widely known and used, at least for some applications. They're not widely used for, for wings and such, but um, the symmetric versions are used a lot in things like tails and winglets. They're just a very common airfoil. So they're, they're good to know. They're called 4 series because uh, they're they're defined by four numbers, um, so let's give you an example. Let's let's say this is a, a NACA 2412, and they're defined by an equation. Um, so by giving you these four numbers, there's an equation that defines the shape of that airfoil, and so we we can change these four numbers and get different shapes. Uh, it's just a convenient, simple airfoil. Again, these are not the best performing airfoils when you are designing your own airplane. You are not going to want to use these. Uh, they're not designed for the Reynolds numbers you're flying at or really, or they're not really efficient across very many uh, conditions, but um, they are, you may use them, let's say for tails and winglets, that, that's something that uh, may make sense. Okay, so let's talk about what each of these mean. This is the max camber um, in percent cord. So uh, in percent cord. So in this case, for example, that means I have 2% camber. Um, and if you remember back to our discussion on airfoil, so here's an airfoil with some camber. And let's say this uh, blue line here, this is my camber line. And this is, I drew this kind of weird, sorry. This is my cord line. This would mean that this distance here, my camber, relative to the cord is 2%. So that height divided by my cord length would be 0.02. Okay, so that's the maximum camber. The second number is the position of the maximum camber um, in tenths of cord. So in other words, in this case, the, the 2412, that would be four tenths. So that means this distance here would be uh, 0 0.4 times the cord length. So 40% along the way of that cord length. So these first two numbers change my camber. Um, as I increase the first number, right, I get uh, more and more curvature in my airfoil. If it was zero, it would be flat, right? And then the second number moves around where that max camber occurs. So it may occur more towards the front, or more towards the back. Well, generally not towards the back, but further towards there. These last two numbers, this is my thickness um, in percent cord. So this would be a 12% thick airfoil. So um, say so this is the maximum thickness. Thickness, that means that T over C would be 12% for this example here. Um, so any NACA section that has, I'm just putting X's here because uh, it could be, in, well actually no, sorry, that's backwards. If I have a zero, zero, and then whatever number there, X just means any number, what would that mean? Okay, so that means I have zero camber, right, and the position I camber is zero, that, that's irrelevant, as long as this is zero, this other one needs to be zero, it doesn't really make sense either way. This means it's symmetric, okay? So any airfoil that's a zero, zero, NACA zero, zero, that means it's symmetric airfoil. So for example, a NACA 0014 means it's symmetric airfoil that's 14% thick. All right, so again, just wanna emphasize these are not the best airfoils, they're just a very widely used one. You'll, you'll see them all over the place and read about them, so you should just know that they exist. And, um, be familiar with what it means.
Okay, so just like we talked about nomenclature for an airfoil, let's talk about some nomenclature for a wing. Um, first is the span, okay? B is the common variable used to denote span. Um, and span is not always super unambiguous. So if I have dihedral, which is as I take my wings and I lift them up this way, right off the ground, kind of like this picture here, span still generally is gonna to refer to what you might call the projected span. So if I was to look at this tilted wing from above, right, um, then the shadow that it would cast, or if I had light coming directly from above, would be the actual span. Not, not the length, because the length is, is actually longer, because uh, at an angle, but that doesn't actually increase the span. Or another way to think about it is if I had to take this wing and fit it through some sort of gate, um, the span is really that gate size, if you will. And there's a lot of things in aerodynamics that will depend on that span, as we'll see, particularly some of our lift dependent drag, as we'll talk about. So this is a very important parameter is the span. Um, the area of the wing is often referred to as an S. Which, yeah, I know some of these variables seem weird, but this is what they are. And there are many different ways to define that area. We won't talk too much about that at this moment, but just note that it's the wing area. I mentioned dihedral, so might as well talk about it. Here's a dihedral. Okay, so if I have zero degrees dihedral, my wing is just flat. Uh, usually you're not gonna have tons of dihedral, you know, but a typical, uh, many airplanes have some dihedral, right? So let's say five, 10 degrees. Uh, it adds some lateral stability, which we'll talk about later in the semester. You can have anhedral where the wings actually droop down. That's less common, but there are some reasons why you may want to do that sometimes. Um, another thing you can see in this wing is what's called sweep. So let's say if I took, uh, this is the quarter cord of the wing. Remember we said, we talked about that briefly. This is the fourth way along the cord. And if I drew a line from here to here along the, this fourth way, this angle here, lambda, is called the sweep angle. And actually there are different ways to define it. Sometimes we call, we call it leading edge sweep if we want to define the angle relative to this leading edge here. Um, that's possible. Most common is with the quarter cord. Again, because of some uh, the aerodynamic, there's some aerodynamic reasons for that, it's where the center pressure it exists for a thin airfoil, but also structurally, uh, this is where the main spar usually is. But in any case, you can think of just a convention here. Sweep is defined from the quarter cord. So as this wing, uh, now we're looking at a top view here, gets swept back, all right? And we'll talk for reasons why we do this, but um, one common one, and you see this in, in transport aircraft as you've flown before, that uh, that sweep, the main reason it's used there is to reduce compressibility drag as you get up to higher speeds. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. For the, you know, low rounds number, low speed aircraft we're doing in this class, there's generally no advantage to sweep. Although, again, we'll talk about this. Okay, so this length here, this is the cord length, right? And this would be, say, the root cord, and this would be the tip cord. So um, generally, your, your wing does not have constant cord. Sometimes it is. If you have an unswept wing of constant cord, we call that a Hershey bar wing because well, it just looks like a Hershey bar. Constant cord, no sweep. But typical airplanes have some sweep. Uh, again, we'll talk about reasons why. You might be thinking about that. And there's no reason why the cord has to just change linearly like it does in this picture. More generally, it can vary, you know, with some sort of curvature of all sorts of kind of all kinds. Um, if this was the root, uh, let's say this is, let's see, here's this, well, it's hard for me to draw a straight line here. Let's see if I can do better. Okay, this is an angle through the cord line, and this is, say, my horizontal. This would be the root twist. And here at the tip, right, you can see it's twisted differently, tip twist. These would be these angles, right? I don't know why I drew one up and one down. But in general, these can vary. So if I take my wing, and now we're looking at a head-on view here of my wing, right, and I can twist it. Let's see, let me 
So one second here. Okay, I just had to grab my foam wing here. Let's look at an end on view here. So twist is like this, right? I'm, I'm kind of rotating it this way. And so the root and the tip can be twisted different amounts. If you could think about me taking this top here and twisting it, this isn't flexible enough for me to really show you, but I can certainly design it that way, to cut it that way so that the root and twist are gonna be, uh, the, the tip and the root are gonna be twisted different amounts. This is definitely gonna happen for your wings and for wings in general. Um, again, it doesn't need to be linear. Uh, it can vary continuously throughout. Okay, a few other um, parameters that are often used are perhaps best illustrated by these examples. And if you look at these, how would you describe the differences that you see? And think about why, why do they look that way? These look very different in terms of wing. So what, what is different about it? Well, one difference you may notice with this uh, sailplane like uh, aircraft on the left is that it has what we call a very large aspect ratio, meaning the span, this length of the span relative to a typical cord is very high. Whereas the fighter aircraft on the right, the span relative to the cord is very small. It has what we call a low aspect ratio. Um, typically for aircraft, find it this way, and this is an A and an R combined. You know, it's, it's a commonly seen that way that instead of writing an A and an R, which is, which is also fine, that's also commonly done. But sometimes you see the A and the R actually connected like that. It's defined as the span squared over the area. So if the area was just a rectangular wing, span times chord, right? If this was span times chord and this was B squared, then you'd just get span over chord, kind of like how we were simply defining it. But in general, we don't have rectangular wings and so just saying chord is, is not uh, clear, right? Because the chord varies continuously across the wing. So this is an unambiguous definition here generally, or less ambiguous, let's say. Uh, span squared over the area, this is called the aspect ratio. Um, you know, the fighter is gonna have a low aspect ratio, maybe say four or five or something. That aircraft on the left, I'm not sure what it is. It looks like maybe 20 or something. It's, it's quite large. Whereas a transport aircraft is typically in, around let's say seven to 10 or something like that. Um, another parameter, uh, and let me, let me write this down, this is called aspect ratio. And I guess we can talk about why, why they might have these different things. Um, you might intuit, again, if you look at birds, that this large aspect ratio helps you fly more efficiently and that's true. So if you look at a, uh, a gliding, uh, airplanes that, or sorry, birds that migrate long distances or that glide long distances, a soaring bird, like say an eagle or something, you're gonna have these long aspect ratios and they can soar really efficiently like a hawk or something. They don't need to flutter, flap a lot because they're really efficient. They can glide very far without having to expend a lot of energy. And so that's very useful if you need to uh, soar and, and, and glide far distances, okay? The downside though of, of those type of birds or airplanes is that your maneuverability takes a hit, right? This airplane on the left can't change directions really quickly. You have a lot of inertia that are spread out. You, know, you can't maneuver as quickly. Whereas this fighter, it's very inefficient from an aer aerodynamic perspective, but the trade-off is that you're very maneuverable. You can very quickly react and turn quickly. So. This is like a hummingbird, for example, at the opposite end where it's not efficient. It has to flap really quickly um, to generate the lift that it needs, but it can react very quickly, right? And turn on a dime. So it's kind of a trade-off that, that we have here. Another parameter, and this is called taper ratio. Uh, again, you know, I, sorry, there's a, I a lot of symbols. These are just the commonly one, commonly used ones. Uh, it's a taper ratio. And it's defined as typically my tip cord relative to my root cord. So this will be for pretty much any practical airplane a number less than one. So my tip or less than or equal to one. 
my tip cord is going to be less than or equal to my root cord. So this just kind of gives me some idea, even though it may vary continuously, I just kind of can look at the root and tip and give some idea of how much it's tapering. So if this is one, I've got a straight Hershey bar type wing. Uh, if it's less than that, I've got some taper to it. Okay, and then the last, just some kind of definitions. Um, let's talk about the force coefficients for a wing. We talked about lift coefficient, drag coefficient for an airfoil, but for a wing or really just an airplane in general, um, we use capital letters instead of the lowercase ones. And so here, this is lift, this is a total lift, right? Not, not like the 2D case where it was a lift per unit span or, or per unit depth or whatever, unit length. Uh, we still divide by the dynamic pressure, but we now, we can't divide by a cord because the units wouldn't work out, right? This is a force. It wasn't a force per unit length, it's now a force. And these are units of pressure. So to get a force, I'm gonna need units of area. So we're gonna multiply by some area. Um, and I'm gonna write ref because it's some reference area. We'll talk about that in a second. Drag is gonna look similarly, drag force, dynamic pressure, some reference area. Um, pitching moment is also gonna be capital things. Pitching moment, and just like before, we're gonna need an extra dimension. So we're gonna have some reference cord that goes in here. So what is this reference area? Uh, in some sense, it is, well, I, sh I don't know if I wanna say arbitrary. Maybe a better way to say it is, uh, you can't really, you can't define a drag coefficient without telling me what the reference area is. So if you tell me your drag coefficient is 0.05, let's say, that doesn't mean anything unless you tell me the reference area that you used as well. So if you remember back to say your introductory fluids class, you would see these tables of drag coefficients. And every time there's a drag coefficient, they also mention what's used for the reference area. What is the convention? Now different applications have different conventions and they usually try to stick to similar conventions. Um, so for a wing, let me just draw this here. Uh, we often use what's, oh, that's not what I want to use. It looks terrible. Um, let me get a little thicker line. We're going to use what's called a, wow, that's too thick. Uh, how about that? Okay, I'm going to use this trapezoidal reference area. Basically what that means is if I took that tip cord and this uh, line here and I just continued it straight forward, whoops, if I could draw straight lines. Uh, and then of course I need to continue it to the other side because it's symmetric. And pretend I drew that symmetrically and this is a really thick line. I go back. So this is what we would call our reference area. Basically the wing area is complicated, right? It can have a lot of curvature. It has in this case what are called leading and trailing edge extensions. Um, but for purposes of a reference area, I want to keep something simple and we usually just use a trapezoid. We take the tip cord, extend it along this trapezoid and then you know continue along the whole wing symmetrically. This is called a reference area. We could use anything we want, but this is just a typical convention. And we also use this because this is again like a top view. This is the area that the drag is going to scale with for the most part. We could use a frontal area uh, or top area, but again for these thin profiles, this is what makes sense. Um, Whereas if we were doing like a, uh, a drag of a, a car, for example, a car is a much blunter shape. Uh, and here's my horrible attempt at drawing a car. Uh, instead of using the top area, it might be common to use this frontal area. So if I was to look at the car head on here, right? here's, here's my car. It might be this frontal area if I was to project the area, um, you know, towards the front. If I was looking at the front and took, what's the area if I smash that car into a flat piece, what would that area look like? That's a common convention. Whereas with the airplane, because it's relatively thin compared to its length, we don't use the frontal area, we use kind of this top area here. And even when we talk about the entire airplane, we often still go back to this reference area, this wing reference area, even though the airplane has a bunch of other area. So again, let me emphasize this uh, area is somewhat arbitrary. We could define it to be anything. We could say we could define it to be um, 
the area of the building in which the area uh, the, the wing was constructed. That's not very helpful, right? But we could do that. It doesn't have a meaning, or, or I should say the drag coefficients, lift coefficients, they don't have a meaning unless we agree upon a convention. So we have to agree upon that so that when you go take your wing, which is maybe a different dimension, um, we use the same convention so that when we talk about lift coefficients or drag coefficients, we're kind of talking about similar or the same, same scaling, if you will. Okay, uh, this is again, is maybe a little bit abstract. This will become a little bit clearer as we start getting into some examples. So I think this is about the point where we've gotten through a lot of sort of the background nomenclature and, and concepts to where next time we can start talking about actual physics. We're gonna get into drag and talk about across about a week and a half, uh, different components of drag and, and how they contribute to our, our aircraft design. All right, so we'll see you next time.